Flexible components. Flexible components are generally not something that people really lean into in 3D printing because there can be some challenges with it. But they really shouldn't be challenges. Really all it is is kind of a design tweak. So today we're going to walk you through some very basic kind of clasps, which you might find in any sort of piece of hardware that might need to connect with some other piece by sliding together and then snapping into place so that it can be removed, or just creating a little bit of resistance for a lid. A lot of people end up going down the wrong road on this, so we're going to give you some examples of how to do it well and how to design it so it can actually be mass produced with 3D printing. So traditionally when people make simple clasps, they end up making a small tab with a bump on it. And this little tab bends backwards in order to then pop into some little hole on some mating feature of some other piece. It's a very simple mechanism that has been used forever. But what folks always end up doing and which always kind of stymies mass production with 3D printing is they end up designing these tabs vertically, which means that the layer lines are going across them when they're printing. And that means that when that tab attempts to flex, then it breaks along those layer lines, which isn't really necessarily ideal. But there is no reason for this to occur. It's mating at a circular component. The flexure of the part really doesn't matter what axis that is occurring within. So why don't we just go ahead and take that and turn it sideways. If you turn it sideways, now that tab is operating within the layer line. So each layer line acts as an individual part of that spring. So there's no possibility that it will ever fatigue or break the way it would if the layer lines were going perpendicular across the part. This way you have the same amount of flexure as you would with any sort of typical isotropic part and you make it actually easier to 3D print because all you have to do is insert a small amount of support underneath that tab which can either go through a vibratory cleaner or just have manual removal of it, which is not that big of a deal. Now, here's the thing. Almost always, whenever you're designing some part for mass production, you never want to leave the slicer to make the decision about how that part is to be printed. So you generally want to go with actual design supports. So since we have this overhang that is sticking out sideways, rather than having it supported by general slicer generated supports and leaving that up to chance, let's tighten it up a little bit and put in a design support, which is just a small little sprue. This small sprue it needs to be about one millimeter in diameter in order to make sure that there's enough meat on it to actually be printed with a standard FDM nozzle. It goes up to right where that the curve of that tab goes up into the air. And there's actually more tweaks we could do here, but this is more than enough for this video. That sprue then connects with the bottom. Now, once that part prints, all you have to do to remove that support is flick it. In fact, you might not even need to flick it if you're designing it very well. That sprue could actually just be there permanently in the final part. And when it flexes and breaks out, it flexes and breaks out, which is not that big of a deal. If it's a part that is assembled only once, there's no reason to ever have that support removed because it'll break across and that finding feature will mate with its partner and you'll be fine. But if it does need to be removed, it's a very trivial operation to snip that out of there and is about equivalent to traditional injection molding where tons of sprues connect different kinds of parts. So if you're ever looking at making a flexible part, something that needs to bend or give just a little bit, just to make sure to design in line with the layer lines. That way you get all of the strength of the material that you're printing with, whether it's nylon, a bioplastic, PET G, or even ABS and those kind of things. You can design for that and you don't have to worry about the layer lines. They don't matter. Just figure out how to tweak the design just a little bit so that you can still get exactly what you want, but now you no longer have to deal with all the upfront cost and risk of traditional manufacturing. This way, you can just buy the part, try it out, use it, start selling it, and then scale up from there to hundreds of thousands without ever having to set your design in stone. Let us know down below if there's other types of features that you'd like us to talk about within 3D printing and how to design them for mass production. These are great little examples of how very small tweaks can really radically improve a part, lower the cost of it, and make it easier to manufacture. So we love any of those suggestions that you guys can see, and we hope you all have a great day, everybody.